Good evening, everyone, and welcome back. Um, if you haven't been for the first two part of this wonderful program of summer's lectures, I'm so sorry if you were in for a delight this evening. My name is Dr. Jessica Gardner, and as the University Librarian of Cambridge, I'm really delighted to invite, to welcome you, sorry, to this year's summer's lectures. The Sanders Readership and Bibliography, which is awarded annually to a preeminent scholar in their field, was instituted in 1895 with a bequest left to the university by Mr. Samuel Sanders of Trinity College. The series continues today in an annual program of Sanders Lectures. This year's lectures have been given by Dr. Will Noel, the Sanders Lecturer for 2019. He was recently invited to serve as the Associate Vice Provost for Strategic Partnerships at the University of Pennsylvania Libraries. And his distinguished career has been characterized by the effective building of successful partnerships between curators and technologists, between institutions and across disciplines. Amongst his many illustrious titles, he is also the director and co-founder of the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies. And the mission of that proud institution is to bring medieval manuscripts, modern technology, and people together to the advancement of learning at Penn and around the whole world. It's a mission we share here at Cambridge. Dr. Noel is an eloquent and passionate advocate for good quality collections of open data. And his TED talk on the theme of open data has been viewed over one million times, which is no small claim. In 2013, he was honored as a White House Open Science Champion of Change. We are honored to have him as this year's Sanders Lectures, Lecturer. And his title for the series is The Medieval Manuscript and Its Digital Image. And it's my great pleasure now to invite Dr. Will Noel to deliver his third and sadly <coughs> final installment of his lecture series, this time on the theme of tools. Please welcome Dr. Will Noel. Thank you so much, Jess, for that generous introduction. Um, I suppose I should say that, uh, that, uh, that I'm, I'm sorry that it's going to be ending, but actually I'm, I'm, I'm not sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with it ending. <laughs> um, this is my old friend, the Sombrero Galaxy, or at least it's an image of the Sombrero Galaxy, which... Uh, it's an image, so it's not speeding away from us at 1,000 kilometers a second. Uh, it's not 31 million light years away. Uh, and uh, it's not 50,000 light years across. It's about, it's about three feet. Um, and uh, how do we know that the real Sombrero galaxy is, 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 is spinning away from us at uh, 1,000 kilometers a second? Uh, we know because we look at scientific data that's made openly available. And we specifically know that it's moving away from us at 1,000 kilometers a second because this, this data, it's not, it's not like uh, an analog photograph. It contains information and you can analyze that information. And specifically, the rays of electromagnetic radiation get attenuated in something called a redshift. And you can see how fast, by how far it's attenuated, how far it's traveling away from us. And by looking at the uh, luminosity of, of, of stars that don't change, like 1A supernova, you can tell how far away they are. Now, this is the wonderful thing about digital technologies. You can apply all these things, and you can do all sorts of things to them, and you can make tools out of them and explore what you couldn't otherwise. Uh, one of the uh, great centers of that is here at the Fitzwilliam Museum with Paolo Ricciardi and Stella Pagnatova with the Mini RA project. And here, by looking at the infrared, you can see the, uh, you can see the carbon underdrawing um, of these, the hours of Isabella Stewart. And by using different wave bands of light, you can analyze pictures in different ways. And they're coming to uh, truly extraordinary conclusions. Um, things can be simpler. Uh, so this is um, an image of your uh, fantastic copy of the Gutenberg Bible. Um, and uh, it was by comparing, by comparing detailed digital images of these uh, that Paul Needham was able to demonstrate that Gutenberg wasn't actually the person who invented identical pieces of movable type. So, so we, are, we, are, we, are, 
we are using digital tools to radically transform bibliography in, in, in so many different ways. Um, but I want to take up a challenge. And the challenge is this. You wouldn't have thought that digital images and digital tools, which are essentially two-dimensional things and can change in scale all over the place, would be good for the nuts and bolts of code ecology. It's an odd thing to think. I'm going to try and demonstrate uh, that. Uh, I'm just trying to go and try and do, do a difficult thing and, and see how digital images and digital technologies can help us with the fundamentals of code ecology. OK, I want some audience participation here. Uh, we have uh, three choirs. We have one choir, of, one choir of six, another choir of six making 12. And we have a choir of eight leaves and then a singleton added at the beginning. Can anybody tell me what's on the 15th or 16th line of folio 12 verso? <laughs> Peter? <laughs> it's the end of December. And the last and the last and the last line would therefore be the feast of uh, Pope Sylvester, the confessor. He would be about here. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is because this is a calendar, right? It's pretty simple. Okay, so so here, can anybody tell me why this leaf is a singleton? An inserted miniature. An inserted miniature. Excellent. So this leaf is going to be a bit thicker than the others, and it's going to be blank on the, blank on the recto, right? And uh, there's going to be an illumination on the verso. James Marin knows about these things. Would you like to hazard a guess as to what type of book it is? Very good. And, <laughs> and, would, you, and, and would you like to hazard a guess at where and when it was made? Okay, this is the manuscript. This is the lofty hours. There's St. Sylvester Papa, Papai. There's a blank 12 recto. And there is a miniature by the masters of the Delft Grisai. <laughs> Very good, Jim. <laughs> so, code ecology is totally integral to the way that texts and images work together. And the person who told us how to do, who taught us to see in this way, is a guy called Henry Bradshaw, who was uh, who was a librarian of Cambridge University Library. Uh, this is this is the home of code ecology, and uh, Professor Beadle gave a wonderful series of Sanders lectures in 2015 about Henry Bradshaw. So I'm going to move on fairly, fairly quickly. Um, he invented the collation formula. He invented it once. He invented it as far as I can see perfectly. And it's gone downhill ever since. Uh, this is a particularly, the, and, and, and although the manuscript people have messed it up in many interesting ways, it's the print people who have truly messed it up. Sorry, print people, but you've really messed it up. So here we go, A to C, the first three choirs, they have four leaves. And the, and the fifth choir, D, it has four leaves. And this thing is, is called a chi. And the chi is a singleton between, between the two. Now, the trouble is, you see, because printed books come in an edition, you can get that chi, and sometimes it can wrap around the C, and sometimes it can wrap around the D. So it's like a sort of quantum particle, right? It comes in, it wonders what it's going to be. Oh, it's going to be a particle. No, it's going to be a wave. Whatever. So you get a particle in one book, and you get a, a wave in the other. And I would say to you that I don't actually believe in quantum physics. There's no such thing as a chi. And the reason that there's no such thing as a chi is because printers don't make books. Binders make books, right? 
That's the immortal words of Jim Green, not mine. So, so what you want to do is to concentrate on the physical artifact and not on any abstract notion. And that is what Henry Bradshaw did. And that is what I am going to do. So Henry Bradshaw loved to take books apart. He did it a lot. He wanted to do it more. The reason he did that is because what he wanted to do was to really see the structure of the, of the book in relation to the text, right? And everybody knows that, everybody who actually does it, knows that collations are difficult to do. And even Bradshaw, apparently, occasionally got it wrong, and he would build models, and he would do all sorts of things to try and really understand how a book was put together. Okay, so my colleague... Uh, oh, 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 I'm going to miss this out. My colleague at the uh, Schoenberg Institute of Manuscript Studies, she's a digital humanist called uh, Dot Porter. She has built this marvellous thing. And with it, I am now, in front of your eyes, virtually going to disbind a book called The Book of CERN. Okay, he here we go. I'm going to create a new manuscript right on her thing on on on, on a place called uh, github and uh i'm going to build my choirs i'm going to build my choir the first leaf of the first choir is missing so i'm going to say that it's missing and i'm going to start the foliation where it starts the foliation now Oh, by the way, those of you that really know the Book of CERN, I'm just concentrating on the 9th century bit. Forgive me. It's going to be cool enough. Okay? Okay. Uh, there are other odd choirs. This is, the, this is choir three. And uh, leaf five is missing from choir three, right? I put these into this system, and what it creates is, uh, is, a, um, a uh, is, is a collation that the computer can read. So stick this file somewhere, OK? That's one, one element of the trick. The other element, element of the trick is you need the images, OK? Hi, Suze. That's Suzanne Paul. How are you doing? I just wonder whether there's a realistic hope of getting JPEGs of CERN anytime soon. If not, perhaps the Cambridge Edward. Can you let me know? Uh, Will, it's now on our digital library. Is that sufficient, or do you need me to send you the JPEGs as a set? Hi, Dot. Can you help? I'd like to illustrate Viscol in my Sanders lectures with the Book of CERN. Can you possibly hack the Cambridge Digital Library and get its JPEGs, and then I don't have to bother the wonderful but very busy Suze Paul? Hi, Will. I've hacked the site before. <laughs> It shouldn't be a problem to do it again. <laughs> I can get you a list of URLs to use in VizCol as early as today. Yeah, Dot, that would be a kind of magic. <laughs> and then we can compile an image list and match that with the collation I've done right. This would be cool. Thank you so much, Dot. Here you go, Will. OK. So she hacks the place, and there's the image list, which is a list of URLs of the images on the Cambridge Digital Library. OK, so now I upload these two files, the collation formula and this list of files with the image list to a place in the sky called GitHub, right? That's the, you, you don't ask, OK? <laughs> Bang. So here is choir two. These are all the choirs. I've clicked on choir two. This is choir two. And this is the outer bifolium of choir two, leaves nine and 15, so I've got 9V and 16R there, and 16V and 9R there. I show you the whole of choir three. And St. Luke, as you can see, is a singleton on the inner bifolium. This is the outer bifolium. This is the other bifolium. I've actually disbanded the Book of CERN. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, now, why? This is important because it puts together uh, the text with the physical 
layout, which is what you really want to do. This is important because you can easily get your collation wrong, and if you get the images and if you put your images up and your collation formula is wrong, it will tell you that your collation is invalid. Um, and this is and this is cool because you can read some things that you cannot do in the book of CERN itself, which is the verso of one page and the recto of another one at the same time. And this is also cool because once you've made your diagrams and you have to turn that into a collation formula, and because you're not Henry Bradshaw, you get it wrong, you don't have to worry about that because the computer... Oh, look, that's me being pleased with myself. <laughs> and, 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 oh, yeah, the, this is a point I was making... This is a point I was making yesterday, which is that, which is that multiplicity is a good thing, right? See, see the same thing in many different ways. So you, here you're seeing exactly the same information on the Cambridge Digital Library, and here you're seeing it in dots, in dots machine. And here you're seeing the structure, and here you're seeing a picture with information. Um, and it is the same information. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not taking the images from the digital library and hosting them locally. I'm just going straight to the Cambridge Digital Library. So then you, then you do all your choirs, you get your choirs together, and then you say, oh, hell, I've got to turn that into a collation formula. No, you don't, because the computer can do it for you. And it will just generate a, a collation formula. And it'll do it, you know, as Henry Bradshaw would have done it. Or you can say, I don't want to do it as Henry Bradshaw would do it. I'd like to do it as Jim Marrow does it. Or I'd like to do it as Fredson Bowers does it. You can, you can just get it to interact with a different a different algorithm and it'll produce it any way you want. Um, yesterday I talked about how the Walters Art Museum drew the, drew the we host its data on our digital open portal open and the Walters Art Museum built an interface that was useful for their museum going public and that, and that pulls in images from Penn at real time. They don't have to worry about hosting it they can brand it as they want, and yet we at Penn, we're data nuts, and we can use the data. It works for everybody. Uh, so uh, right now, we're coming towards the end of, uh, of, a, of a project to digitize all the medieval manuscripts in Philadelphia. Uh, Phil um, the Schoenberg Institute has about um, 2,000 books, um, but Philadelphia generally is a book city. It has um, wonderful Wonderful, wonderful libraries. You wouldn't have thought medieval manuscripts, but Charles Frederick Lewis was a great collector. Uh, it has about 500 medieval manuscripts. Uh, the Rosenbach Library for those, yeah, really great. It's a book city. And it has, um, and it has uh, about 500 manuscripts scattered over 16 institutions. Uh, we host all the data on open. What we didn't really invest in was the interface for that data, because we think interfaces come and go. So we just grabbed, we just rang up the guy who built the interface for the Walters and said, can you, can you do it for ours? And, uh, but tweak it so that, so that it can work for many institutions, so you can have a search by institution. And that's what, that's what we did. So here I'm searching on... Uh, the Free Library of Philadelphia. This is all the Free Library of Philadelphia's books. Uh, here, I'm searching on books of ours. And I'm going to... And all this stuff is being pulled directly from OPEN, right? Uh, pretty cheap, pretty easy to make. Uh, uh, so I can page turn it, OK? So here's, here's Pope Sylvester, right? This is the end of December. And this is the Mass of St. Gregory. And it looks like the scribe didn't bother to fill in those words, which is kind of interesting. But anyway, uh, so this is 12 verso and 13 recto. Okay. Uh, also, a bucket load of metadata, uh, mainly by my colleagues, Erin Connolly, who's in the room tonight, um, Nick Herman, Dot Porter, and Amy Hutchins. Okay. I can do something else. I can click on, click on this little thing here. And when I do, I get the choir structure of the book. So here's the first choir. I hope you can see it. 
It's a choir of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 leaves because it's a calendar. Okay, now I can click on choir 1 and it's taken apart for me. And I click on a detail and it shows, uh, it shows, it shows one recto, which is January, and 12 verso at the same time that's San Silvester. It shows the bifolium. Because digital information is actually so malleable and because it requires humans to put it in order with the help of machines, you can actually reorder this stuff quite simply and you can reveal more than you can easily see in the codex itself about the structure and state of the text. Okay. You'd have thought that uh, size is also a problem for digital images. Uh, this is a book of hours, and, and this, is, this is, yeah, why size is important. So uh, Christopher de Hamel tells me that he, uh, he was once on the front desk at Sotheby's, and uh, he liked to guess the books that were coming in before he opened them. And one day he walked, someone walked in with a, with a bag with a book in it, and the book was sort of bulging. He could see the <coughs> size and shape of the book. And Christopher said, I know what that is. That's a book of ours. And the guy replied, no, it's not. It's mine. <laughs> Size sets expectation. Size really matters. But, but what is size? What is size in the 15th century? In the Baxendale sense, what is size in the 15th century? Well, one of the things, that, one of the things is that paper comes in standard sizes. And this is actually a pretty good abstraction of a 15th century piece of paper. I've got to put a, I've got to put a choir fold in it. Paul Needham calls it, because during manufacture it comes with a, with a choir fold. Okay. And, and what you can see is a watermark roughly on one half of one side. Don't worry about this thing. This is Schoenberg Institute branding. We don't have a countermark in the 15th century. Right. Uh, we have chain lines running vertically in this orientation, and we have a uh, decal, around, decal around the edges. I think those are the things I want to say right now. Okay. Um, but paper comes in more than one size. So this is, a, this is a tablet that still survives. It was in the market square in Bologna. And it tells you, and it's, and, it's, and it's to scale, it tells you what an imperial sized piece of paper is. It tells you what a royal sized piece of paper is. It tells you what a median sized piece of paper is. And it tells you what Paul Needham would say is a ch chancery sized piece of paper, right? And chancery is this, is, is, is this size. The thing is, that that might only be for Bologna. So how do you know that those sizes work throughout Europe? Well, if you're Paul Needham, you, uh, you measure incunables from all over Europe, 39,000 of them. And when you've done that, you come out with pretty standard sizes all across Europe, OK? And this is an imperial folio. So it's an imperial full sheet <coughs> folded once, sort of works. Think uh, Nuremberg Chronicle. 
This is a royal folio. About 42 centimeters high. 30 centimeters wide. Uh, and you can think uh, Gutenberg Bible. You can have a median folio, which can't be more than 35 centimeters high. And that's, that goes there. And you can have a chancery folio, which can't be more than 31.5 centimeters high. OK. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. So I'm I'm going to put these down now. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to put them down quite yet. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to do this. and leave it unexplained for a while. And I'm going to do, all right, do this and leave it unexplained for a while. OK. So, um, OK. So all these different sizes, they have one thing in common, which is that if you take the width of the sheet and multiply it by 1.13, 1 1.13, 1 uh, 1 point thank you. <laughs> God, I love my audience. Okay, you multiply it by 1.414, you, uh, you get the height, and that's the square root of 2. And this is an invariant ratio, which means that you can fold it in half this way, And the chain lines run horizontally now. And this is a quarto. And the relation to height to width is 1.414. And you can do it again. And you get an octavo. And you can do it again. And you get a 16 mo. And so on. You can do it again. And you get a 32 mo. Right? They all have that. They all have that, that rough proportion. OK. So how do you explain these ones? Uh, well, you don't find them in books. You find them in manuscripts. And these are chancery agenda quartos. So they're folded on the long side, like that. Sorry, that's a royal agenda quarto. And this is, a, is an agenda quarto made out of a chancery sheet. OK? I'm now going to lay these books down. OK. Once you've done all that, and you've done all the paper sizes, there are 64 possibilities for the sizes of books in, in paper in the 15th century. In order to know the size of the paper, you need two things, right? You don't just need the format. 
you need the format and the paper size. It's not enough to say quarto. You have to say chancery quarto or royal quarto in order to get the paper size. And believe it or not, there's no term that I know of in bibliography that sums up this notion of size of paper on the one hand and format on the other that comes up to the size of the folded page. So I invented one, and I call it flavour. The flavour of your paper. So I call it flavour because it's sort of double barreled you know, like raspberry ripple, chancery folio, rum and raisin, royal quarto, something like that. So flavour. OK, and I'm now going to talk about flavours. So, you can do it in manuscripts. Uh, DD11 is actually, it, it's, a, it's a manuscript, and that is your standard candle. That's, that's that one. Uh, this is the chancery one. Uh, that's that one. I've done them to scale by my library card, right? Uh, which is the same size, so you can see how much bigger the royal ones are than the chancery ones. So this is a chancery agenda quarto. This is, sorry, a royal agenda quarto. This is a royal folio. This is a royal quarto. And this is a royal octavo. This is a chancery agenda quarto. This is a chancery folio. This is a chancery quarto, and this is a chancery octavo. I've now laid these two things side by side. So this is my, this is my chancery ladder. This is my royal ladder. GG329 is a royal quarto. DD352 is a chancery folio. And they are approximately the same size. Royal Quarto. Chancery folio. OK? You need to know the paper's flavour. Format on its own is not enough. And indeed, you can have double scoops. Uh, this is ULMSHH313. The page on the right is a royal quarto. The page on the left is a chancery folio. And I've been lying about DD11. Uh, this, is, this is a compilation of three manuscripts. The first one is indeed a royal agenda quarto. The last one is made of parchment. In the middle, in the mi so here is the, is, the first, is the first one, and the chain lines are running uh, horizontally, and the, uh, and the uh, uh, sorry, the chain lines are running vertically and the laid lines are running horizontally and the watermark is in the middle of the page. That's a royal page. Uh, there's the watermark. Here we've got something funny. Here we've got something funny. So the chain lines are running horizontally. I don't know if you can see them, but, but there they are. And the watermark is down in the bottom half of the paper. It's not really visible. I'm sorry about this, but there's some of it. And if we go back, this here, this here is the choir fold, that little line there. And what you've got here is something I haven't seen before, and it's slightly counterintuitive. It is a chancery agenda folio. which I've not seen before, but comes out at roughly the same size as a royal, a 
agenda quarter. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Flavors are a pretty satisfactory way of thinking about paper, especially if you've just been around the Saint-Chapelle for three hours with your dad. <laughs> but there's a problem. And the problem is that unless you're Paul Needham, how on earth do you remember all these numbers, right? Is this why, is this why there isn't a single manuscript catalogue in the world that tells you the flavour of your paper? Because to me, it seems an utterly basic thing to do. So I thought I would do something about that. And uh, I put Paul Needham's brain in a box. Uh, this is the Needham calculator. And I'm going to do paper in a book. There's the height, 31. There's the width, 22. The chain lines are vertical. I can see decal on the top. And I can see decal on the right. And now I'm going to calculate. The only available flavor is chancery folio for this book. Rock and roll. That's fantastic. So there we go. You don't need to be Paul Needham anymore. You can just go to needhamcalculator.net and you can classify the very basics of your, of your machine. Uh, so I, I changed here. I've got everything. Uh, 30, 20, chain lines horizontal. Uh, you get a royal quarto. OK. Now, I'm happy to have the trimming argument at the end. I am one of the very few people in the world who can tell you that actually medieval manuscripts were trimmed on, on behalf of, on, 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 on average, about 13%. 13% is not normally enough to change, the, to, be, to, 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 to mess up the calculator. So, for example, this is a manuscript in Cambridge. I didn't put the number in, which was careless of me. Uh, it's the Rule of Princes. It's Hockley's Rule of Princes. And it measures only 22 centimetres by 17.5 centimetres. Uh, but its chain lines are vertical. And I ask the calculator what it says, and it says the smallest available flavour is a chancery folio, which is 31 centimetres by 23 centimetres. So it's a good eight, eight centimetres. It's been chopped down by eight centimetres. And that might be hard to believe. I think I'm right. But what, this make, what, 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 what makes this thing is, in fact, it's the same size as a quarto, more or less. It's just got its chain lines vertical, so it can't be a quarto. Someone's chopped it down to be a grubby little quarto to hang out with those medical and legal tracks that are no great interest, when in fact it's a wonderful literary manuscript and it, was, and it had broad margins and it was a lovely folio. So these, these are... Um, all the, paper, all the paper manuscripts that, uh, that Orietta Darrell kindly gave me the list of all her paper manuscripts, and I, and I, and I looked at them all, and I, uh, and I did the measurements like this, and this is, and this is what they come out with. And uh, uh, this is before 1500. And these here, there are very few royal folios, not many. These here are chancery folios or royal quartos. And these here are royal octavos or chancery quartos, and these here are royal sixteenmos or chancery octavos. And there's a step where you don't get books of that height. OK, it's England's different. Uh, oh, yeah, and you can see, and now I'm plotting it uh, height versus width, and you can see how they concentrate, right? OK. I said there is no manuscript catalogue that I know of that does flavours. There is a manuscript catalogue I know of that does formats, and does formats very reliably, and that's the Manuscritti Datati d'Italia. 
uh, it doesn't do uh, paper sizes, but you can work them out. Uh, and uh, it, it, you can go to this website and you can look at them all, one by one. Or you can get your mate, Mitch Frass, who knows how to do this, to hack the site and download the whole data set. Uh, we tried to do that, but because it's not open data, it's actually too, too messy to really for me to use. So I had to interlibrary loan 27 volumes of the Manuscripti Dittati, which is one of the wonderful things about American libraries. Uh, but still, OK. So when you do that, I've got just shy of 1,000 now. And the, the graph might look vaguely similar. These are manuscripts. So that little bump there is a, is, is, a, is a paper size I haven't introduced you to yet. It's called Super Royal. Uh, it goes up to 45. Uh, these ones are royal, going up to 42. This little bump here, these are medium. These are median papers at 35. That's, that's, that's these ones. OK? And these ones are either chancery folios or royal quartos. Median quartos. Chancery quartos or royal octavos. How am I doing? Yeah? And, and, and here I've got a chancery octavo or a royal 16 note, right? Around there. And if I put height versus width and I color code and I color code the various bits of, diff bits of paper, I can, I can do this. So these are the super royals. These are the royals. Big drop to median. No books around here. These are the median folios. These dark reds are the chancery folios. These, uh, these are the royal quartos. These are the median quartos, the chancery quartos, the royal octavos, the median, the median octavos, the chancery octavos, and the royal 16 notes. Now, you might think that this is digital wizardry. It isn't. It's an Excel sheet, right? It's just an Excel sheet. This is not digital wizardry. This is just getting data largely out of books, putting it into a form where you can manipulate it, and then you can visualize it. And you can visualize these flavors and these formats over time. So here I'm starting out in 1300, and I'm basically just on chancery, chancery and median folios. And then I have uh, an early royal, royal folio in about 1350. And then I start getting octavos, but only in uh, only just sort of after 1400, uh, and then and then around 1460 or 70 it goes haywire, and then starts to drop off because of the invention of printing. Okay. I uh, I got pretty pleased with my tool. I thought it was fun. So uh, I started to experiment with um, single sheets and print. This is a painting by a guy called Georg Gartner, sold at Sotheby's in 2018 in February. Uh, and um, what's cool about it is that there's a print in the background. And the print ha is on a piece of paper, and the, print and, 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 and the paper has a margin. And, of course, so often in 15th century prints, we don't have the margin. We don't have the margin because they get grubby. Collectors just keep the thing. That's normally all the evidence we have. But, you know, uh, I went to Schreiber. And I looked at Schreiber, and I looked at all the metal cuts in Schreiber. And I stuck them in Excel. I, I do all this stuff with, with measurements, by the way, because I'm an administrator. I don't have time to think, but I can just get 10 minutes to go into more. And then I stuck them in a graph. And this is, th th 
there's a lot at 5, none at 8, a lot of 10, a lot of 16, 17, a lot around 25, 24, 25, and then very few, and then around 32, and so on, right? They're, they're steps. So paper was invented before printing. So I start out with a completely crazy hypothesis that the entire printing industry, all the metal sheets and all the, engra all, and all the copper plates, for example, they were all the size they are, and therefore the pictures are all the size they are because of the paper that they were designed for. Just a hypothesis. But you st so these are, these are the heights of uh, the metal cuts in black, and these are the heights of the Italian papers as they survive in yellow. There's, there's a great deal wrong with this graph. Like the, like the metal cuts, okay, they're from Northern Europe and I'm talking Italian paper. I just want to do this because I thought, I'm just telling you how, I, how this happened. I was just having fun. Okay, but so I look, I look closer. And I went to the National Gallery and I started looking at metal cuts with my iPhone. Because, because they never show you the they never show you transmitted light of these things. Okay, so uh, here we are, and I have here uh, paper that's 20 by 21 uh, and 13.8, uh, and I have 15.8 by 11.7 for the image itself, right? And uh, my, I enter in the details here, and it says the smallest available flavor is a chancery quarter sheet. If this is a chancery quarter sheet, that's, that's what it looks like. And the chain lines are horizontal and the watermark is there. Okay. So this one, it's amazing how small a lot of these things are. This one, the image is uh, 4.8. And uh, the paper is 9.2. You put it in the thing. The chain lines are horizontal. You calculate the smallest available flavor is a chancery 16th sheet. Okay, it looks like, it actually looks like that. And with the watermark in the, in, in, the top, in the top right. Okay. So I'm going to start with a chancery 16th sheet, okay? It's about five centimeters high. I'm then gonna do a chancery octavo size metal cut at about 10 centimeters, and that's what that looks like. And then at, coming in at around 16 centimeters, I got a chancery Quarto metal cut, right? Quarter sheet metal cut. Coming in at 25 centimeters, I've got a chancery half sheet metal cut. And coming in at around 32 centimeters, I've got a chancery full sheet metal cut. Now, this one is the same size as the inner one of this one, right? And that's because when it was first made, this one was just the inside. And then they made what's called a pass pass two, and they, and, and they stuck an outer frame on it. And in doing so, they made it go from a chancery half sheet metal cut to a chancery full sheet metal cut. So I proposit that you can categorize metal cuts by the paper that they were made from. Okay. Oh yeah, and for the last one, there's the, so, so the watermark is down here, so it's a full sheet. For some reason, they, they, they prefer to do chancery uh, full sheets than royal half sheets. Don't know why, but they did. Okay. <laughs> what about engravings? 
So that seemed to work for all metal cutters. What about engravings? Okay, I've got to hurry up. Uh, okay. Uh, so, so this is 7.7 .7 by 7.7. .7. It's a Schoengauer coat of arms. The, uh, the watermark is there. The chain lines are running horizontally. This is a chancery, this is a chancery quarter sheet. Uh, this is from his passion sequence. Every, every passion sequence uh, Schoengauer I have seen. Uh, the chain lines run vertically. The watermark's in the middle. This is a chancery... What is this? A chancery half sheet. Uh, I keep going, and I have uh, the nativity by Schoengauer, the watermarks at the bottom, the chain lines are running horizontally. This is a chancery full sheet. And uh, this one is pretty massive. The chain lines about, the watermarks about here, the chain lines are running. This is a royal, a royal full sheet engraving by Schoengauer. Okay. So there, there we go. That's, that, those are the steps. That's how it works. OK, you stick them both together, the metal cuts and the Schoengauer, and they look pretty similar. But actually, they have an utterly different conception of the margin. So a metal cut that's 16 centimeters high is, is, on, a, is on a chancery half sheet, and a Schoengauer engraving that's 16 centimeters high is on a chancery full sheet, a whole format higher. They have a completely different conception of the margin, and um, Schoengauer's conception of the margin had a future. OK. Now, parchment manuscripts don't come in standard sizes. This is the slippery slope of parchment manuscripts from Italy. Uh, from the Manuscritti Datati, I've got about, I've got about uh, just over 600 of them so far. They, you know, there, there, there are fewer that are smaller, and there are, uh, there are fewer that are bigger, and most of them are here, but there are no steps in this graph that I can see. So manuscripts don't come in standard sizes. There we go. So, even though manuscripts don't come in standard sizes, they do come in a standard proportion. They come in a proportion of 1.414. Why do they become, why do they come in a standard of 1.414? Well, actually, it's got nothing to do with the standard sizes and everything to do with the proportion. Because when you make a manuscript, what determines the size of the manuscript? Well, it's the smallest sheet in your herd. Right? You get the smallest sheet in your stack. And then you decide what's it, what its width's going to be. So you decide what its width's going to be, how, how wide it can be, and you make a triangle. And you take it and you put it like that, and you make a right angle triangle. And if that's the width, then the height that's going to work is the hypotenuse of that triangle. So that is how you know how to make a good book. And it's better than that. It's better than that because then, of course, you can just fold it in half. And in order to make a book half the size, you just get a whole stack, cut them to 4.1439, and cut them in half, and then you've got, you got the folios that you need. So that is proposed. That is how I propose that they did this, sort of like that. And this, of course, you've seen before, because this is exactly how they make palimpsests. And I propose that the geometry of palimpsest making is totally normal, bog-standard procedure by medieval scribes taking skins. And so I end these Sanders lectures with the same idea that I began with. The Archimedes palimpsest, a remarkable manuscript, and its digital version, the Archimedes Palimpsest data set, which I hope you agree is an equally remarkable data set. 
As ever, I need to uh, thank the people who should actually be up on here on the stage with me. I would be honoured to think that Paul Needham is behind everything that I've said, except that those of you that know Paul Needham would know that he wouldn't come up with the absurd generalizations and, and, and characterizations that I've made on so little data. So I must have had something to do with what I said. Uh, everything I know about paper I know from Paul Needham. Dot Porter, she did all the Vizcol stuff. Um, Orietta, very kindly, uh, gave me all her paper information about Cambridge paper, which is pretty good because I'm supposed to talk about Cambridge manuscripts and it's hard to do that from Philadelphia. So thank you, Orietta. And finally, I couldn't have done any of this without Suze Paul, who is the smiling face of Cambridge manuscripts and rare books. And it's to her that I would like to dedicate this lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tour de force. Those of us who've been lucky enough to be here on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, your brilliant narrative arc that brought us back to your beginning as well. Absolute masterclass. Um, today, you promised us that you would show how digital tools could redefine bibliography, and you definitely delivered. I was a little anxious when you were moving into hacking the Cambridge Digital. That would be cool too. Taking part of the uh, Book of CERN, uh, one of our treasures, digitally, that was also brilliant. Um, and the very great care. Two our pieces here. I have had a, I've had a wonderful time Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I know that is true for many of us here. Um, we are pretty much on the dots. There are uh, drinks outside. Langley suggests that Will deserves that drink. <laughs> so, um, I think that perhaps if we can we can all say a big thank you to him again. And I know he'll be around for drinks for a little while for questions. Yep. That, but I think we should just end with a real sense of appreciation and thanks for a brilliant 2019 Sanders lectures from Dr. Will Noll. Thank you so much.